All right, so I guess we'll get started here. Um, mm -hmm. Welcome everybody to the week two Q&A of the BWSI Pi Pact Independent Project. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm pleased to see folks are getting pretty engaged. Some of you obviously are finding the process maybe a little bit more straightforward than others, and uh, we'll do our best to get everybody chugging along. So, uh, so we'll we'll do our best to get everyone chugging along. But um, I'm also pleased to see a lot of you submitted questions, um, at least before today. Uh, maybe not by necessarily 1700 EDT, but uh, I'll take it. The more time we have to uh, review the questions, the better answers we can give you. So let's jump straight into it because. Uh, kind of the point. So we're going to start with a collection of questions. Um, and just for everyone's uh, reference, not reference code, but everyone's reference, um, the, the at hyperlinks in the title of the slide are the links to the Piazza post that uh, this set of answers is supposed to address. So should be able to give you some traceability there. And addition, additionally, uh, let you see uh, whatever those conversations that are going around those questions are. So there's a lot of questions about how to use the reference code, what to use it for, why to use it, how to get it, so on and so forth. So we're going to go through all of that, okay? So first let's start with what is it, okay? So it's, again, the baseline or the instructor-written Python implementation of a Bluetooth low energy beacon advertiser and scanner, all right? And so the advertiser broadcasts beacons and the scanner scans for those beacons. Um, again, go back to the previous uh, sessions, um, discussions for more detail on how that all works, but that's just the bottom line. It's our implementation of that core functionality. So how do you get it? So the first link is to obviously the PyPack repo, you know, so um, you can see here, again, this is the repo we went over um, earlier this week. It includes how to get it, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for those of you who are maybe a little less uh, familiar with how Git actually works, this is a nice little tutorial on how to basically get that repository. Basically, you can follow this. It's it's a very simple command uh, that I will show you later. Git clone, and then the repo uh, address. Okay, so so that's that's how you get it. So where do you put it? Well, you want to put the reference code on the pies. You do not want to put or on any Linux-based device that has a Bluetooth. Uh, radio on it that you want to use and that um, and there's some additional caveats has to be compatible with Blue Z you know so on and so forth and and we can't really go into everything that's viable but we know the pies are viable and so normally the reference code goes on the pies it does not go on your personal laptop you know it does not go on your desktop it goes on the pies okay and so once it's on the pies, what do you do with it? Well, you use it to collect data. That's the bottom line. It's a very simple set of steps. You create a beacon, you scan for the beacon, and you log the data that you collect. Additionally, you're welcome to modify the code. It's, again, that's why it's open source. You know, I could have made it a compiled, like sort of executable that you guys want to be able to see the source code. But it's open source, so you guys can muck about with it as you feel like. You know, if you want to have a different interface, you know, you don't like the arguments we've provided, or you want more, you want to put a GUI on top of what somebody already has. Uh, you want to do a different command structure. Maybe you don't want to do, you know, two SSH terminals, or one is for the beacon and one is for the advertiser. You want to unify them. You just want to do like one sort of uh, you know, thing that kicks off everything in, in the order it, needs, it should happen. You can do that. 
maybe you want to change the way the advertising the scanning is scheduled maybe you know you want to turn it on and off in increments you know it's conducive to the to the way you're conducting experiments so for example i know that uh, i'm going to conduct my experiments so that at every 10 seconds i'm going to move one foot and i want to collect data for 10 seconds and rather than have to like you know start and stop things manually i can adjust the scripting or the code so that it does that automatically. You're welcome to do that. Do whatever you'd like to the code. There's really no harm, no foul. Again, you just need to own it, all right? So I'm gonna review this. We went over this on Monday, but I'm gonna review this again for um, everybody's edification. And I put it here. Uh, everything that I have listed here is also in the readme, it's in the documentation of the code itself but you know we're going to go through this a little bit more slowly because i think some people really have struggled with this so i'm going to go uh i'm going to back out of this real quick so again um i'm going to connect to uh i'm going to connect to the pies that i have downstairs all right so that's one pie. And here's the other pie. I'll just make sure. All right. Let me just hide these controls. Okay. So pie. That's one. The here's the other. Okay. So if you if you have the vanilla image or if you, if you have the uh, pre-configured image, the reference code is already loaded. It is this directory. Okay, that lives in your home directory. Okay. Um, what I'm actually going to do is on this Pi. I'm gonna uh, get rid of it, or maybe that's a little, let's not get rid of it, because maybe I'll mess something up. Uh, I'm just gonna make a, a, a test directory so that I can show you how you would clone this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the code from this GitHub repo, all right? Um, so there's gonna be a button up here that says clone, and you'll want to clone it you know, unless if you're logged in via, um, if you have SSH key associated with your GitHub account, you can do clone with SSH, but you can also do clone with HTTPS. So you're gonna copy this link, all right? And you go to your terminal and you're gonna say git clone, and then you're just gonna paste that link. And it's just gonna grab that code. And then you can see here in this folder, I have a copy of reference code. You know, and it's it's got what is in this repository right here, okay? And you know, you can use all the standard git commands um, to see, you know, what is going on. So I've updated the readme a few times. I fixed an error, thank you to somebody who identified that for me. Um, but that's how you get the code. And again, we're not here to give you a Git tutorial, but that's the, you know, uh, that is basically how you get the reference code. Uh, I hate this thing. I'll get rid of it later. Okay, so you're gonna go into your reference code on each pi and you're going to see that there's a couple of files, right? There's a config.yaml, a Python file, and a couple of readme, some markdown files, okay? The first place we're gonna start is with the config.yaml, all right? And that's what is captured here, right? The first step, setting up the configuration. So there's a couple of options available to you, all right? You can edit the configuration YAML, which is what we're about to do. You can use the command line arguments, 
or you can edit the default configuration coded into the module, which are on lines 26 to 76 in the Python code. The key thing to remember for all of these is that there is a priority order to which what they all can specify the same thing, but of these three options, there is a hierarchy and order to them. The command line arguments take top priority. Anything you specify at the command line override anything else. After that, arguments specified in the YAML override the default arguments. And then anything you don't specify as a command line argument or don't specify in the configuration YAML are taken from the default arguments. All right, so keep that in mind. Now there is a subtlety that we'll get to about how to use a configuration YAML, but that's in step two. So let's go ahead and look at what, what happens um, when we adjust this, uh, and I apologize if you can hear all the dings. Um, but this is the YAML, right? And you can just adjust things, right, directly. So for example, I'm gonna change the timeout this is this first pie is going to be the advertiser. I'm going to change it so that it uh, times out after. Well, let's not make it longer. Let's make it short. Ten seconds, okay? That has a minor value of five, okay, and a major value of two. All right. I'm not going to change anything else on this end, right? So that's how I'm changing the configuration YAML for the advertiser. All right. You can do the same over here on the um, scanner side, okay? And instead, I'm gonna leave the timeout, okay, to be 20, just fine. I'm gonna increase the revisit to be every two seconds as opposed to one second uh, for whatever reason. I'm gonna change the prefix, okay? Of, of the files that get generated. So instead of this PyPack scan, I'm gonna change it to demo scan, okay? So I'm gonna save that, all right? So I've, I've adjusted the configuration YAMLs on both ends, uh, on both pies, all right? Now, that's all good and well, all right? I could run with those configuration YAMLs as is, but Maybe what I want to do is I also want to specify, you know, I'm running, uh, this configuration YAML I've configured is sort of generic. I'm typically going to use 90% of the values, or the, uh, I'm going to use the same configuration 90% uh, of the time, but on occasion, I want to change something. So rather than change it in the YAML every time, you know, going in, editing the file, and saving it, you can change it at the command line. All right, so what I can do is I can say sudo python3 pypact.py, okay? Then I wanna say, again, this one I'm on now is the advertiser, all right? I wanna use this configuration file, all right? So I need to specify it. If you don't specify it, it either uses only command line arguments or the default arguments, all right? You have to specify the configuration YAML if you're gonna use it. It's just a way to make sure you, you're explicitly specifying what you're doing. All right, so I'm gonna to point to the um, config YAML, all right? And if you remember, I changed the timeout. I changed it to be 10 seconds, all right? I made it shorter. But let's say for whatever reason, I need that timeout to be longer, all right? Because my experiment is longer. So I'm gonna specify the timeout and set to be 30 seconds, all right? Oh, let's just make it 60 seconds because I'm gonna be doing stuff around the other pie. I don't want this to run out. So if I didn't specify this timeout, uh, let's just see what happens actually. You'll see here that it says, starting beacon advertiser with timeout 10, all right? And it'll run for 10 seconds or I could stop it but you know, 10 seconds ran out before I could manually stop it. Instead, what I can do is I can use the command line argument to say run for longer. I'm not changing the configuration YAML, but I am specifying changing that specific configuration value. So now if I run it this way, what happens is, as you can see here, it's starting the beacon advertiser with a timeout of 60 seconds, all right? 
Now I'm going to go and start up the advertiser. All right. So sudo Python three, or not the advertiser, the scan, uh, the scanner. PyPack.py scanner, and I am going to specify the config YAML. All right, and PyPack config. All right, and then I'm going to run it in the background, and it's going to go ahead and start running. All right, and it runs with uh, 20 seconds in the YAML, all right? And you'll see shortly that it, it'll scan for 20 seconds. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and kill this one, uh, the advertiser, because you know it's gonna stop the advertiser. The scanner is still going. I could let it run for 20 seconds, but you know, there's, well, there we go. 20 seconds has elapsed, all right? And so you can see here that, you know, this is, Basically, I've gone through the configuration. I've shown you how to do a few different ways of configuration. Started and stopped the advertiser and scanners, either manually or automatically with the timeout. And you can see here that the, the file that was generated, the data file I was generated, took that configuration value from the configuration YAML. And so if we go and look inside of it, I'm just gonna blow this, make this big so we can look inside of it. You can see here, if you look at these timestamps right here, right here, or these sets of timestamps, you can see that there's a separation of two seconds approximately between every scan, like I specified in the YAML. All right. And so this data file is what is generated. And this is the data file you'll want to parse and use to do your experiments. All right. So I've captured all of that um, in this set of options from how to set up the configuration, how to start the advertiser on one of the Raspberry Pis, all right? You know, and we've, we recommend you know, use a configuration YAML first, and then when you need to adjust things, adjust them with the YAML and the command line arguments. You could just use command line arguments, but again, then you'll be using the default arguments in the code plus the command arguments, or you just use the default configuration hard-coded. After that, you know, after you start the advertiser, you'll want to start the scanner. It has a very, it has an identical structure of options. Then you want to stop, typically you stop the scanner before you stop uh, the advertiser. Um, which is actually my mistake. I made a mistake in these in the slides that ignore step six. That should not be there. Step four, and then step five, which is stopping the advertiser. And then step six is you know inspecting the collected data. All right. So you know I just went in with Nano. You could do CAT, which is just printing the output to screen, or whatever your text editor of your choice on the Pi itself. You could optionally transfer the data to another computer. So, you know, there's a discussion on Piazza be using SCP. There's a number of, uh, you know, FTP clients effectively, whether it be FileZilla, WinSCP, Core FTP, that can let you take those CSV files and put them on your Windows machine or your Mac or whatever. And you can use Excel or, you know, TextEdit or WordPad or whatever you'd like to uh, look in it. Um, so, uh, so that I hope, hopefully this combined with the README will hopefully explain to you how to use the code. Um, all right. Uh, da, da, da. Let me just quickly look at the Q and A. Uh, do, do, do. All right. All right, so I'll answer those later. All right, so there's been a lot of questions about coming up with a hypothesis, right? How do I come up with that hypothesis you've talked about, right? That you said, you know, is at the crux of our project and hypothesis or hypotheses. All right, so let's establish some common expectations, all right? So bottom line, you are responsible for coming up with your hypothesis. You can take inspiration from anybody and everybody but at the end of the day the hypothesis you put forward has to be the one you define and you pick all right 
those should be synonymous, but I know sometimes they're not, all right? It can be as general, so, you know, general meaning I can be super ambitious. My hypothesis is that we can do contact tracing with Bluetooth in all scenarios, all situations, all configurations of devices, environments, uh, hardware, weather, you know, all things we can do it. Uh, that is a really generic or very general hypothesis that's going to be very, very challenging, in my opinion, to prove out. On the other end of the spectrum, you can be extremely specific. You can be extremely specific about which devices, so you can focus just on the Raspberry Pis. You can be extremely specific about the ranges involved, that the hypothesis is all about that I can tell you are too close based on Bluetooth, RSSI values, um, if you're within you know, three feet. Or within, or exactly three feet. You know, you can be as specific or as general as you'd like. The the caution or the uh, responsibility you take on with being uh, with a very general hypothesis is is uh, going through enough data collection and enough experimentation to show you've explored the breadth of that general hypothesis. Um, in contrast to very specific hypothesis where you've dived so deep into that specificity that you've collected enough data to show that there is no uncertainty in what you are trying to prove out, right? If you're trying to prove out specific devices and specific ranges, we need to see a lot of data. We need to show that there's like little to no uncertainty in your conclusions. Um, now, on top of all that, right, you can, your hypothesis can either drive or be driven by the data you collect or both, i.e. it's an iterative process. So, you know, you can start with a hypothesis, you know, I conjecture this, and collect data that is based on that conjecture, right? And therefore, that data should either prove or disprove and or refine your hypothesis. All right, and by refining your hypothesis, now you have a new target for data. Alternatively, you could just say, let me just start collecting data and try to understand what is the fees, what, what can I learn from this data? Is there any trends? Are there any patterns? Is there anything I can sort of identify as being a potential hypothesis or potential reality in this data? And therefore, you know, the data leads to a hypothesis. And once you have that hypothesis uh, based on the data you've collected, you'll continue to collect data and start this iterative process of refining your data using your hypothesis and refining your hypothesis using your data. So there's no clean start or end point to this. It is always iterative, okay? The key things we expect, you know, particularly when it comes to what you write, what you present in the final report, is you need to explain how your hypothesis fits into the larger goal of enabling contact tracing. So your hypothesis has to be related to contact tracing with Bluetooth devices. We're not looking for hypothesis, something like, you know, the moon revolves around the earth, you know, orbits the earth. That's not exactly related to blue contact tracing with Bluetooth devices. So keep your, hypothesis topical to pi packed, all right? And you need to demonstrate the relationship between your hypothesis and the data you're using to evaluate it. So uh, at the end of the day, they have to feed off of each other. They have to support each other. Your hypothesis, your conclusions, your, or your uh, um, evaluation of your hypothesis has to be supported by the data you collect. And the data you collect has to show a clear motive, uh, you have to show why you collected that data um, based on the hypothesis you chose. What you do not need to do is get your hypothesis approved, okay? So we're, we, we've offered an opportunity to, for us to give you some input, um, but with the sheer number of you that our ability to do that's gonna be limited, um, we'll do our best, but you don't need explicit approval from us. You do not have to stick with the same one throughout the project. If you want to um, test a hypothesis out and you learn like, you know, and 
X number of days or weeks later that it's just not the right hypothesis, you can throw it away, start new. Um, that is your judgment call. And you only, don't need to only have one. You can evaluate as many as you'd like. Just remember to treat them. Um, when you write your report, you need to acknowledge any sort of differences between the hypothesis in terms of the level of treatment. Um, just, you know, if some have gotten a lot of attention, then we expect more uh, sort of detail, more exposition on those versus ones that you may not have had a chance to explore as thoroughly. Um, if you want to review, if desired, go to uh, um, post 79. Um, this, the bottom line is send an email to this address uh, with this subject line. And be sure to include a sufficient description, but also be concise. Um, if I get, you know, if, if we had to review like, you know, 10 pages, not that email really has pages, but, you know, if I see like 10,000, you know, words, I may say, you know, shorten this up because I don't have the time to view 10,000 words. All right. Uh, so let me go back to the questions. All right. So there's a few. Um, where will we turn in our hypothesis? Uh, that's a related one. So you're not technically turning your hypothesis before the final report. When you write your final report, you'll write down what your hypothesis is and describe it. That's where you'll effectively turn it in. Prior to that, if you want it to be reviewed, we'll obviously get some uh, insight. Uh, we'll be able to look at it, but you don't have to turn it in before the final report. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. So there was another question about project pacing. Um, so we put out a recommended schedule, you know, and it's kind of recommended in the sense of these are the things we're going to be talking about during each of these intervals of time. But this is not strict by any means. Execute, this is why it's an independent project. Execute the project at your pace, but the only threshold or the only requirement is final report reports are due at the end of week six. All right you're going to have to deliver those. The exact timing and duration of any high level task is up to you. So for example, if you're still trying to get, uh, it's not really, this may be a bad example because some of you are just struggling with technical difficulties. If you need more time to get the system up and running, then take that time. But if you're up and running and you're collecting data, you know, and you think you have enough data uh, that you can just, you want to just get into saying, can I do these detection, proximity detection algorithms? You can jump right in next week. You don't have to wait till the end of week, uh, start of week four to do that. Vice versa, if you want to collect lots of data, you know, you want to spend weeks two to four, you know, and even into five collecting data or just collect data ongoing, um, then go ahead. Uh, you know, and these aren't hard and fast boundaries. It's just sort of saying at some point, you do want to transition some of your thinking between these topics. That you sort of want to get off 100% data collection uh, at some point and start thinking about your algorithms um, at some point, right? So the so, but you right the logic is that you need data to develop algorithms. So that is why there's a sort of a sequential the schedule put out there. Um, ba balance the project workload as defined by you, so whatever you think the workload looks like, and your other commitments. And I say other commitments because we, a uh, number of you will be starting up um, the other BWCI courses shortly, and those are obviously gonna take up time, uh, and your other summer commitments. So just, you know, time management is a skill we all uh, need to have and develop, and this is just another exercise in that. Uh, all right. Another question, previous PACT related research. Um, so we're not, we're not pointing you necessarily to anything super specific, okay? Um, the internet is a great place for uh, scholarly research. Um, you know, just go to scholar.google.com. I actually found this out today. It turns out IEEE Explore, uh, if you're looking for COVID-19 related articles, it, you actually can search and access those articles for free. You don't actually need to have an IEEE Explore or IEEE account. Um, so that's great. You know, you guys can go and uh, look for that. There's, I've already looked, there's a number of uh, academic articles about Bluetooth-based uh, contact tracing, 
both you know in the positive and the negative use all that information to your um, to your benefit you know doing literature reviews and background research is a key part of uh, research in general and you know what you should be looking for out of such uh, reading such uh, reviews is both inspiration right so coming uh, getting ideas right if, if you're uncertain about hypotheses or the types of experiments to conduct you may find inspiration in this in this reading uh, if you have your ideas sort of settled you might find validation in doing these reviews in background because sometimes you know that's what we kind of want to what we need to really commit to ideas is understanding that we are not completely off topic, not completely off base. And clarification, right? That there may be uncertainty in your ideas and that other people's perspectives, other people's research may help you clarify your own. Um, so those are all things you're going to uh, want to use uh, such resources for. Um, my, our recommendation to you is that anything you find in doing this uh, research you document the sources of so you know make a word document make a text document anytime you find an interesting article just copy that hyperlink right so that when you uh, go to create your final report you can you'll be able to cite them later um, because you know it's gonna lend a lot of credence to your thinking that um, to the conclusions you make to the approach you've taken by virtue of knowing that uh, by demonstrating that other uh, academics, other professionals, other people who are doing similar work as you have, uh, you know, are either in agreement or are thinking along the same lines and are, or even if you're refuting something that somebody else has propositioned, um, has put forth, you are acknowledging their work, right? Uh, you, you don't want to make a, um, a sort of, uh, claims in a vacuum otherwise they have no reference point they have no uh no way for us to understand their frame of reference so with that uh let me review the questions real quick uh, all right okay okay um so let me answer this last question, which is the last sort of uh, pre-question uh, I took from Piazza. Human analog. So somebody asked a really interesting question about, you know, what can I use as an analog or a replacement for a human in my experiments? Um, and I guess I really should clarify what you're, what you're probably looking for here is an analog or a replacement for a human in terms of how they interact or what they do to Bluetooth signals. Um, it's a good question. I don't have a clear answer. There are, um, so a lot of you, I'm sure, from any number of sources, whether it be Mythbusters or CSI or any one of those pseudoscience, uh, you know, forensic shows, know about like ballistic dummies, you know, pigs for ballistics, things like that. Um, RF uh, sort of representative, radio frequency representative human analogs are actually pretty difficult to find, at least by virtue of the, my simple searching for options. Um, I'm going to look into this some more, but I'm almost sure that anything we find will be out of your price range. Um, there has been a lot of interesting conversation on some posts, um, you know, 83 on Piazza about maybe uh, using water or a sack of potatoes. Um, and I think that's great. You know, you can definitely um, experiment with those uh, things you can sort of acquire easily. Um, you know, and maybe one way to validate this is to do sort of a, a correlation experiment. And, and again, uh, always take with caution that correlation is not causation, right? Um, so maybe one way of doing this is that saying like, look, if I stand between my pies and they're broadcasting, um, or the difference between when I am not standing between my pies and the signal I received, between when I'm standing between the pies and the signal I received is fairly similar to when I put a sack of potatoes in the way or when I 
put this, you know, I don't know, pick a, pick a material, pick, pick an object in the way. Um, and, and I can sort of show it, it tracks as I move further, as I change the distances between them, as I change the orientations of the devices, and I sort of have more belief that they are represent, they are, they are at least presenting the same, um, what we call shadowing or fading is the technical term. It's called shadowing because you're basically shadowing the signal the same way, uh, you know, a source of light would be, uh, the, the illumination of the light would be shadowed by an obstruction, by an object. Um, so, you know, that might be one, and that would be an extremely interesting uh, contribution to your overall um, exploration, your overall project. We definitely be, that'd be a great uh, little uh, section in your final report. Okay, um, do, do, do. so let me go through the questions now, starting from the top. I'm having difficulty coming up with Bluetooth experiment ideas using an ethernet cable. Do you have any ideas for those of us who are not using a wireless network? Um, yeah, so a couple of good ideas would just be to, um, so obviously, uh, you know, it depends on, so I'm a bad example in some ways of, uh, of the things I could do. I, I'm, a, I'm a home improvement slash tech nut. So I have, you know, 200 meter spool long of ethernet cable that I can uh, terminate myself. So I can run, I can create arbitrary lengths of ethernet cable for myself. So. I could do these outdoor experiments with an ethernet cable, but assuming you don't have that, that you're more tied to something that's like six feet long or maybe a couple of meters or things, something like that, um, maybe what you can do is test uh, things involving fabric or having the devices in bags or containers, right? In the same way we might put cell phones in pockets or in a purse or in a backpack right you can put your devices you know sort of close together uh and maybe one or both in different enclosures and sort of model the idea of like uh can i do this detection uh reliably when uh, as you know as sort of the lockdown or, or uh, social distancing rules relax and people start to get closer together so for example on a subway or a bus are queuing up, right? People have their phones or their devices in different enclosures, and uh, they'll be still be relatively close together, but now there's these obstructions in the way. So maybe my hypothesis is about doing the proximity detection in these environments, and you could do that uh, with relative with a wired configuration. So that's some ideas. Um, you want to obviously your limitation is how far apart can you get the devices. So use that as a jumping off point and layer on the different ways the contact tracing may be deployed. How, okay, so how does the presentation work? Do we do a PowerPoint to present our findings? Great question. So everyone's gonna submit a written report, okay? We're gonna provide a template in due time. Um, it's just basically gonna be sections. We're gonna tell you sort of, you wanna fill in this section that's like an abstract, you wanna fill in an introduction, describe your hypothesis, describe your data collection process, you know, present some of your data, present some of your algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll give you a template. Um, that we are, we're going to have a final event and we're still figuring out exactly what that is, but um, I think what we're probably gonna do is have some of you, um, some of the more most interesting uh, final reports um, basically record their presentations uh, and record presentations of their work and we're gonna string it together in, in, a, in a sort of a stream. And uh, to that end, you will be presenting very much like what I'm doing to you now, uh, of uh, presenting slides and whatnot, but that won't be for everybody. And we'll give you more details, we suss out those details, but um, it will be at a minimum, a written document a la Word, PDF, et cetera. Uh, those of you who knew LaTeX, thumbs up, uh, <laughs> just a nerd like that. How do, okay, so next question. How do we adjust the code to modify our experiments? 
So we uh, talked about this a little bit. Um, I guess uh, if I read between the lines of um, how do we, so um, I showed you how you adjust. Uh, sorry, uh, let me, let me go back to you this. I showed you how to adjust the configuration YAML, right? So the configuration YAML gives you a few different options. So let's just review these real quick. Um, for the advertiser, the first option is what is the file I'm going to put that, that echo one into that file to stop the thing. No real reason to change this, but if you want to change it, you can. You know, if, you, if you're sick of typing out advertiser control all the time, you can make it real, sh real short. Stop. You know, you can do that. It's as simple as that. Um, timeout is a, is a decent one. It's just, uh, you know, how, many t how, how much time in seconds do I want to let this advertisement go on for unless I manually stop it? Right, and this is just a way to avoid letting the advertisement run forever. Um, you know, if you want to go forever, just leave it blank. All right, leave it blank. Um, but you know, or you know, put in a really uh, oops, uh, put in a really um, sorry, put in a really large number. Oh my God, I. I don't know why, you know, like 5,000 seconds. Um, if you want to make sure the UID is really identifiable, you can put in a name. Um, same with the major and minor values, just to make sure you don't confuse them with anybody else. Transmit power, uh, this is for you to explore with. You know, how does the amount of power I transmit with affect the received signal? You know, I can go really low, or I can go really high. And then how often, um, this is a really interesting one, the interval. Uh, how often does the advertisement uh, basically repeat? Um, and this has a big implication for how such a system might be deployed because uh, just to use a, a more relatable uh, uh, analogy is if I ask you to shout out loud or yell, at a regular interval, all right? If I ask you to shout every, you know, minute, your voice is going to be a lot better off over time than if I ask you to shout every one second, right? You're gonna, your voice is gonna wear down, run out of energy a lot faster than it would if you're yelling at one minute, at intervals of one minute. The same is true for Bluetooth, right? The more often we advertise, the more energy it's draining. So the more energy it is draining from your phone, um, let me see if my iPhone shows up. Nope, phones apparently don't show up. So, um, you know, if it dra drains from your phone, so the, the, the greater impact it's gonna have on sort of quality of life, quality of service of this application. So maybe your experiment is, can I do this reliable detection proximity using a much bigger interval? Or does it need a very fast interval? You know, something even faster than 200 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds, because I need to hear that advertisement a lot, All right? Um, on the scanner control side, same thing with the scanner control file the, that was with the advertiser file. Um, with the prefix, this is a, you should adjust these just so you separate uh, your experiments. So I'm just gonna, the way I would use this is if I was doing an experiment, you know, indoors, I might say this is indoor experiment, and my, and my experiment is all about, you know, what is the values, I'm, what is the RSSI values I see at six feet? So indoor, six feet, you know, and I have no obstructions. Right, you know, so that when when this file gets written, and I get that that name tells me what the data is about, and then when I go to do a different experiment, you know, I, I want to come in closer with my uh, with my experiment, and so instead of six feet, I'm at three feet. I change it. 
I change that part of the file. And so make this as descriptive as, as it needs to be so that you know what is in that file. Because as you saw when I showed you the CS, what the contents of the CSV are, it doesn't tell you anything about the experiment you actually did. It just tells you the data that was logged. So you need to rely on the, this file, file name, and also the notes you take. Make sure you keep notes, like we said before. You want to document what your experiments are about. Uh, same thing with the timeout, just you don't want to scan forever. And then the revisit. So um, unfortunately, there's just a lower limit of revisiting at one second, but you know, maybe a scanning takes energy too. So instead of scanning every one second, you know, can I do this with a much lower scan rate at you know, 10, every 10 seconds? Um, the filters, you're going to have to read the code. I don't have time, um, or we'll answer this on Piazza possibly, but read the code. Read the comments in the code to understand how the filters work. And then you guys don't need to really touch the loggers. The logging configuration is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't see any reason for you guys to change it, but you can look up how logging in Python works to adjust this. All right. Um, not going to save that. So let me just ask, answer the rest of the questions. All right. Uh, blah, blah. Uh, my Mac is not recognizing the micro SD card when I entered it into the slot. So I tried using an SD card adapter. It is not recognizing the card there either. So I guess it's unclear what is meant by not recognizing the card. Um, you. Hmm. So it's uh, it's unclear to me what is meant by that. Uh, so whoever that is, if you could raise your hand, real quick. And Joel or Lisa, can you unmute them? Yeah, we're looking. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, nice. Megan, you're allowed to talk, talk now. Oh, hello. Um, so for my my issue is that um, it just didn't show up at all. Like the card didn't show up on my like the Finder or the Disk Utility. Have you tried both cards we provided? Yeah, I tried both of them. Hmm. I was thinking, should I try it on like a like a different computer, like a, one of my family members, to see if it's my computer that's the problem or something like that? That's a, that's a absolutely. I mean, that's an easy thing to try. So I'd highly recommend you you just try that. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah, yeah. we'll do some research as well. Um, maybe if you want to post in Piazza. Um, so let, I'm sure you're not the only one with the Mac. Um, I saw some thumbs up for your question. Maybe other folks can chime in. If this seems to be a common enough issue, we'll devote more resources to trying to figure it out. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, apologies, I don't have an answer for you right yeah. off the bat. Yeah, that's fine. All right. All right, on the scanner side, what is the purpose of the advertiser's transmit power? Um, so it's a, it's a volume, basically. Um, it's how loud the broadcast is. Um, the scale that's, as you, that you would see in the code, uh, you'll see documented or otherwise um, uh, limited to from minus 40 to four in integer increments uh, is uh, from the weakest signal to the strongest signal. So minus 40 is the weakest signal you could broadcast and four is the strongest signal. And so, the stronger the signal is, the more likely it is to propagate further, to be received more easily and with greater strength. So, and, and that goes along with the ability of the signal to get through obstructions, to get around obstructions, to be uh, so on and so forth. So you don't really need to modulate this too much, but if you really want to sort of play, your hypothesis involves uh, exploring you know, what is the bare minimum of power needed to do detection uh, or proximity detection, then you can, ex you can play with that value, right? Explore whether, you know, I need full power versus half power versus minimum power, right? 
So how will I know which pi is which when I log into them using SSH? Well, it's a little bit of bookkeeping, all right? Um, but uh, let me just give you an example. So here's a, uh, I think I know which one. So I'm gonna SSH into um, the other pi from another, from the first pi. Um, so you can see here, when I try to log in, it says pi at this address. Um, it, it's all, you could, uh, if you're asking how you physically know which one, um, you're gonna have to sort of keep track. I personally, I put, I put a little uh, piece of tape, color tape on each one, or a little thing, uh, like a little uh, label that I write which the IP is on it, um, and just stick it to the pi, you know. Uh, that that's the way I physically discriminate them. But if you SSH in, you can tell which one it is just by um, the address you are connecting to. Right? Uh, is TX power a scale that is universally recognized? For example, no. Great question. So, for example, will a TX power of one from an iPhone speaker be as powerful as a TX power of one from Raspberry Pi? I wish that was the case, but no. Every radio, every imp device's implementer treats it, does not, is not guaranteed to treat this universally or consistently. Um, this is a big challenge with PACT in general, is that uncertainty. Um, again, why we provided you with the PIs, which is why this is the, ex ex this is the environment we've, we've decided to put forth just because it removes that uncertainty. Um, but, uh, you know, you can do your own research about how much variation has been observed, um, even within the own iPhone family. They've changed from generation to generation. So one does not mean the same thing between, you know, the six, the seven, the eight, you know, to the 10, the special, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what are proximity detection algorithms? Well, proximity detection algorithms is the basic premise of PAC. It's the notion of two people being too close for too long, right? The idea of if you're too close to somebody for too long, you're at a high risk of transmitting or being infected by COVID, right? Or, an, uh, or infectious disease. So proximity detection algorithms refers to the fact that we're trying to detect when, you're, when two people are in proximity of each other. Um, how are we supposed to gather data? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Um, the bottom line is to use the basic, so if you want to use the reference code, uh, is to use the way I just showed you how to use the reference code to, to create advertisers and scanners and to log data. Um, and to, but the exact nature of the data you collect, the experiments you conduct is entirely up to you. Again, look at the readmes, look at these recordings of these lectures, you know, people are already putting stuff in Piazza. Um, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record and I definitely don't want to sound, um, uh, how would I put this, uh, dismissive, uh, but it is an independent project. You know, we are not here to put the template or the recipe in front of you. We've put the basic goal of you know coming up with the hypothesis is within the packed sort of larger pack goal of using of doing contact tracing or proximity detection with Bluetooth devices, and it is up to you to figure out what slice of that you're going to explore. People who are posting tech errors, please Google it and otherwise post it on Piazza. It's a lot easier to help you there. Absolutely, um, it is definitely easier to help you there. I can't talk. Uh, commands, I can post commands, um, along with, uh, um, I, I want to, we have uh, John Northoffer from, who's another Lincoln staff member. A lot of you have received a lot of help from, he's now an official instructor, yay. Um, so he's gonna help you guys a lot. Um, so it's not cropped in, the sand disk is brand new, so it's full space. Okay, so I think that's just, um, so, for units of measure, we should stick to the metric system, correct. Um, I'm a big fan of the metric system. Uh, 
I think so. You know, time. Though, as you saw with the parameters, um, let me log out of this. Um, with the parameters in the config file, there's there's nothing in here that a unit that are metric or have any distinction metric units. Um, but when you do when you're describing distances, when you're describing um, well, distance is really, I would prefer metric, but, uh, you know, not going to hold anyone to it. Use whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, when using my phone as an iBeacon advertiser with an app, Raspberry Pi cannot find the iBeacon using the Pi Pack. The beacon from the app has a valid year, uh, I'm sure. Uh, there, that is a good question. Um, Odds are good that, uh, so with the PyPack scanner, I have tuned it a little bit to work with reciprocal scanners uh, with, within this ecosystem of the beacon being set up with the PyPack as reference code and the scanner being set up. That way you're not getting a lot of noise. Um, I would recommend you go look at the PyBlueZ and the GetLib documentation. You're gonna find uh, additional examples how to broaden that scope uh, you know if you if you're interested in doing that um, again part of the independent research part of this but we, we were going for a minimum deployment uh, so we're running it we're up here at five o'clock I'm going to answer a few others that I think are need Need some. So here's a good question. So if my logic is correct, the advertiser isn't taking in signals as it is only a beacon advertising signals, while the scanner can take in data but can't broadcast anything. So your logic is absolutely correct. And just to give a little bit more clarification, it is not a, the fundamental limitation or the thing that causes this limitation primarily is that the majority of Bluetooth radios are not what are called full duplex radios. So duplex refers to the fact that a radio can both transmit and receive a signal at the same time. So while it's, I guess a really horrifying example of this would be, think if your mouth and your ears were one organ together, you know, as horrifying as that sound. Uh, if using that one organ, if you're speaking, you could not listen at the same time. Or if you're listening, you could not speak. So that's the same way these Bluetooth radios work, right? So they can't do both at the same time. There are Bluetooth devices that are full duplex that could both be a beacon and a scanner at the same time. And they could hear themselves then. Um, but that's not the case with the Pies. Uh, do, 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 let me, this, so this is the last question I'm going to answer. Uh, so, and then I'll, I'll, we'll get, we'll try to get the rest of these in Piazza, or if you guys want to post them in Piazza. So when I'm collecting data with the pies at three meters apart with the beacon interval at 200 milliseconds and the scanner interval at one second over a 60 second time interval, I find that the RSSI is distributed at either around minus 58 to minus 66 dBm, or about 10 times power difference. There is a gap in between those two values. Is this gap normal? Um, so in some level, this is normal. Um, so if you dig real deep into the Bluetooth protocol, you'll find that beacons actually do something called power cycling. Basically, they step through a couple of power. Uh, do both. They do. They do both power and channel cycling. Um, so they sort of modulate. They they go through certain levels of power incrementally. So what you may be catching is discrete power levels um, that uh, it's cycling between. Um, there and there, of course, on top of all that is sort of natural variability of. Um, uh, multipath, second time around signals. Uh, multipath is a great and fascinating concept that I would love to talk more, but you know we don't have the time for that. Um, so with that, uh, thing, uh, you know, I think we we got 
a lot of good questions this week, and we uh, hopefully we've done justice to them. Um, again, if you're having technical difficulties getting things stood up, Piazza is the place to put those questions. Um, you know, and we'll try to answer some of the things that are more uh, sort of exploration, research oriented there um, as well. If you guys aren't comfortable, uh, if you want to ask a question that is not, you know, sort of your secret sauce, you don't necessarily want to share with the larger group, feel free, feel free to use that PIPAC-BWSI uh, email. Uh, we'll try to get back to you. But again, uh, emphasis on independent project. We really are looking for you to chart your own course, debug your own issues. Um, that's just the nature of research, right? If it was... If it was merely a formula to follow, it would not be research. Um, and uh, we wouldn't be looking for the best and brightest to be executing it. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna say the session is effectively closed and uh, we'll post all of this. Uh, uh, we'll have the recording up shortly and we'll uh, share these slides as well for a later reference. Ramu, do you want to just tell them who's speaking Monday? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I is believe, it Louise Ivers? Uh, Dr. Louise Ivers, who is uh, an epidemiology slash infectious disease expert. She's going to really uh, give you guys a great overview, a great uh, explanation of the public health sort of side of this, right? Uh, we've had engineers, we've had computer scientists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We've talked very technical, very technology oriented, um, but the deployment, the acceptance, and the, and the use of this to make um, real public health policy decisions, uh, Dr. Ivers is gonna give you a great insight into that. So please attend, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, hopefully she's going to um, really uh, dispel any myths or concerns you have about at least the way PACT is going to be applied to the larger public health concern, but uh, it's gonna be a great talk. All right, with, with that, uh, I hope everyone has a great weekend. You know, don't spend all of it collecting data, but you know, spend some of it. All right, thank you. Thank you.